Hello students, welcome to Meso study again. So we are discussing about the chapter molecular basis of inheritance. We have discussed about each and everything in detail regarding the transcription, translation, replication process. We have also discussed about the regulation of gene expression as per the lac operon, the trip operon etc are considered. Now in the today's session I have compiled around 10 questions that we will be discussing. And those 10 questions, some questions are from 1 mark, some questions are from 2 marks and some question 3 and the 5 marks question. So I will tell you how to attempt such type of questions. Some of the questions they are from previous year CBSC exam, your 12th board exam. So let us see how to attempt such type of questions. Now let us start the today's session with the question number 1. So the question number 1 is a 1 mark question. The question says name the enzyme that transcribe H and RNA in case of eukaryote. Now, first of all, tell me the full form of this HNRNA. HNRNA is a heterogeneous nuclear RNA. And what is the full form of RNA? That is a ribonucleic acid, right? Heterogeneous nuclear RNA. Now, they are asking about the enzyme. And here the process which is mentioned that is our transcription. How? Because they have written the transcribes. So that means they are referring to the transcription process. That means what they want is from a DNA we have to form a RNA and that RNA that is mentioned in the question that is a HNRNA. So whenever these Transcription happen, the enzyme is required which is called as a RNA polymerase. Because we are discussing about the eukaryotes, so the major enzyme which transcribed is called as a RNA polymerase 2. So this is a correct answer for question number 1, right? This is how you have to attempt. If you will write the RNA polymerase 2, you will get a complete 1 mark. Now, let us move on to the next question, question number 2. So, just read this question by the time that we prepare this board. So, question says, how is repetitive or satellite DNA separated from a bulk genomic DNA for various genetic experiment? A bulk DNA is there and we have certain repetitive sequences present in case of the eukaryotic DNA. And majorly we have this repetitive DNA sequences present. These repetitive DNA sequences they form, you can say that overall when we say the amount of these bulk DNA they are very, very, very high. When we talk about the separation, the separation in the genetic experiment is done by density gradient centrifugation density gradient centrifugation density gradient centrifugation so for question number 2 correct answer is a density gradient centrifugation let's move on to the next question question number 3 so question number 3 is also a one mark question if you will be able to answer this, you will get a complete one mark. So mention the role of codon AUG and UGA during protein synthesis. Now tell me one thing, another name of protein synthesis that is called as a translation. That means they are referring to a translation process in which the RNA they will form a protein. And this RNA is called as a messenger RNA. Now, whenever a protein is formed from this, we need certain enzymes, we need ribosomes as well and one of the important feature is that they require one RNA which is called as a tRNA. tRNA full form is called as a transfer RNA. Transfer RNA, they are they carrying certain anticodons or you can say they carries amino acids. They carries amino acids. 
they, this tRNA they goes to mRNA later on they decode the whatever the sequence which is mentioned in the mRNA they are having an NT codon present in them and they are having an amino acid attached to it and these amino acid they are left over there after that the uncharged RNA there is released and again and again similarly the triplet codon is there which is being converted into an amino acid sequence. Now that triplet codon which is mentioned in the question that is a AUG. AUG is called as a start codon, start codon. This is that codon from where the translation always starts. Translation always starts with AUG, this you have to remember. And this is carried by a tRNA which is called as a charged tRNA because they carries one amino acid with it and name of that amino acid is called as a methionine. Which amino acid? Methionine. Right? Now, this methionine later on they are attached and further so many other amino acids they are added and in between the enzy enzyme is there which is called as a peptidyl transferase which help in the formation of peptide bond between the different amino acid protein chain will be formed. Another codon which they have mentioned is a UGA, UGA, UGA is a stop codon. It is a stop codon and this stop codon does not code for any amino acid, does not code for any amino acid. That means, that means whenever such type of codon they will come in mRNA, the whole translation process will stop there only. That the sequence of amino acid which is formed which is attached to one another by peptide bond they will also stop and ultimately that amino acid chain a long chain amino acid that will be released right. So AUG is a start codon whereas a UGA, UAG etc, UAA etc they are stop codon. So this is a role of these two type of codons. Normally there are three different codons which act as a stop codon and we have discussed in detail in the sessions. Now let us move on to the two marks question. So state the difference between a structural genes and transcription units of the prokaryotes and the eukaryotes. Very good question, very important question as well. Yes there is a difference in the structural genes of a prokaryotes and the eukaryotes. What is the difference between them? Difference is that when we talk about the prokaryotes, the structural genes are there. These structural genes, they are having a direct sequence that can be coded. First of all, they will transcribe them into a messenger RNA and later on the translation happens and protein is formed. Whereas to talk about a eukaryotes, eukaryotes they are having a certain sequences which does not code for any protein. That should be removed. That is removed with the help of post transcriptional modification and that is called as a splicing. Hope you remember the two words which I am referring over here. They are called as a exon and enterons. Exon are those which act as a coding sequences. In between the non-coding sequences they are also present. These non-coding sequences they are called as a enterons and they form a bulk. Basically what, what is the function of these enterons? They produce a hetero zygosity or they produces a th diversity within the gene so that a different combination of different proteins can be formed. Let us discuss about these. Now the structural gene of prokaryotes, in case of prokaryotes no non-coding sequences are present. No non-coding sequences are present. That means in them the introns they are not present. So can I say no intron? Whereas when we talk about a structural gene of a eukaryotes, structural gene of a eukaryotes, they are having a introns present in them. They are having introns present. They have a two region basically intron and then exon. Right? 
Interons are called as a non-coding sequences. Whereas exon is called as a coding sequences. There is a difference in the sig significance of each of these. Even when we say the introns are there and today we know they are non-coding sequences. But they do have a certain significance as well. Come to this side. Let us discuss about a mRNA which is formed. Suppose this mRNA they are having a certain sequences like this. They are having suppose this region is there, then this region is present, after that this region is present. Right. Now suppose this region is called as a exon 1, this is called as a intron 1, this is called as a exon 2, this is a intron 2 and this is a exon 3. Right. Whenever we talk about a translation process. Before that, all of these introns, they are removed. If I say introns are removed, then process is called as a splicing. A lariat formation is occurs, spliceosome formation happens. So, we will not go into detail. Now, what will happen? All of these, they will be cleaved like this. That means, we are left with only exon, exon, exon. This is a exon 1. This is a exon 2, this is a exon 3. Now the introns are removed. Now what I want that these exons, they should be joined. When they are joined, let us talk about certain situations. Suppose they are joined like this, in which the sequence is 1, 2, 3, E1, E2 and E3. The type of protein which is formed, that is a P1. Let us talk about a situation in which there is a first E1 formation, after that the E3 is there and the E2 is there. When they will translate into a protein, a different type of, type of protein will be formed that is called as a P2. So, hope you are getting what I am trying to say. A different kind of protein can be formed from a same mRNA. This is because of the presence of these intron sequences or the non-coding sequences which is present in them. So, this is a this is a significance of these introns which is only present in case of the eukaryotes which is not present in case of the prokaryotes, right? So, hope you can write about this question that is a question number 6. You can easily attempt subtitle question. Now, let us move on to the next question. Question number 5. Now, very good question, very easy direct question. State the function of following in case of the prokaryotes. So, to talk about a tRNA, tRNA is also called as a transfer RNA. Transfer ribonucleic acid and this is called as a ribosomal RNA, ribosomal ribonucleic acid, right? Now, tRNA is that which is called as a transfer RNA, transfer RNA, the function of transfer RNA is that they carry two things, one is called as a anticodon and second is called as a amino acid, right. Each of these, they are having a specific function. What are those functions? Anticodone, they are complementary to, complementary to codons. And where these codons are present? Codons are present on mRNA. Right. So, they will go and they will read whatever the sequence which is present in the mRNA, they will go and read over there. And because one specific tRNA is there and that tRNA, they carry the amino acid. So, they will go and they will give one amino acid. They will decode this and they will give another amino acid. Again and again, they will give amino acid and amino acid and an amino acid. They will keep on giving. Not a same type that depend upon the codone or anticodone which is present in there. Right. And basic procedure or if we talk about the whole procedure, they are helpful for a procedure which is called as a, we all know that is called as a translation. Translation. 
translation right so what i want is now the amino acid sequences is there out of these the whole protein sequences will be formed my desired protein will be formed now just come back to this rrna that is a ribosomal rna so ribosomal rna they have two fu function one is called as a, they act as a catalytic unit and second it act as a structural unit hope you remember the translation process where i have discussed the first of all the smaller subunit of the ribosome they come when we talk about in case of the eukaryotes let's take an example of a eukaryotes in case of eukaryotes the ribosome which is present is of ats and the prokaryotes the ribosome is of 70s these are the two different ribosome they are present so they act as a catalytic and the structural unit and which help in the process of translation right so we have discussed about the question number 5 regarding the functions of the trna and rna now let's move to the next question that is a question number 6 where does peptide bond formation occur in a bacterial ribosome and how that means they are talking about a peptide bond how this peptide bond is formed you know when i was discussing about the protein synthesis the ribosome is there in the case of the ribosome there are two site one is called as a p site and second is called as a a site p site is there and second one is called as a a site p site whenever we talk about a first amino acid let's take an example of a aug or the methionine when first amino acid comes they always comes at p site right the second amino acids they come at a site and later on whatever the uncharged amino acid is that is released from a p site and that charge and they will left their amino acid with it that amino acid will be bound to a trna which is present at the ta site now what will happen this trna which was present at the a site now they will shift shift again back to the p site you know about the process of i am discussing about the process of the protein synthesis so they will again come back to a p site now the a site is empty for a new you can say the charged trna here i have discussed once there is a shifting of these amino acid towards the a site definitely they will attach themselves to the amino acid of another what happens is that peptide bond is formed and that peptide bond is formed between two the coh group of first amino acid and again amino group of second amino acid right peptide bond and when we talk about the peptide bond we can call it as a conh bond that is a conh bond when we write in a normal way we call it as a conh bond right this is a c o n h bond is the such type of bond is formed this is called as a peptide bond and the enzyme is also there and that enzyme which is responsible for peptide bond formation that is called as a peptidyl transferase peptidyl transferase right this is how the peptide bond is formed enzyme we have talked about we have talked about the two different sides this is how you have to attempt this question so this was a question number 6 uh, 36 which is also of a two marks so even this question you have to attempt in a very short answer type don't write too much for just for a two marks so let's move on to another category here 
it is of three marks question. How many codons code for amino acids and how many are unable to do so? When we talk about a codone, a codone is there. We have discussed about the, these codes. In the genetic code, I have discussed genetic code. I have discussed that a triplet codone is there. Triplet codone is there. That means three nucleotides they code for a one amino acid. Right. And today we know there are around 20 amino acid present. Though research is going on in this direction towards uh, discovering the more and more amino acids as well, but we will be focusing on only the 20 amino acid which is already being discovered. Now the 20 amino acids which are present, they are coded by total 64 codons. And if I say a correct data that is around a 61 codons. Out of these, the, actually there are in total 64 codons. 64 codons are there. So basically, it is a calculated with the help of a formula that 4 raised to power 3. How? Because we know the chances that each and every nucleotide is 4. 4 different nucleotides are present. This is a nucleotide four different nucleotide that we know today, right? They form a DNA structure and three because the three nucleotides are there which codes for one amino acid. So when we will calculate this, this will come out to be a 64. So overall the 64 codons are there and these out of these 64 codon only 61 they code for 20 amino acids. Whereas what about the rest three? Rest three codons they do not code for any amino acid rather than they code for stop codone. That means this is the place where whole translation stop. Translation stop. Right. What are these three codons? These are UAA, UGA and UAG. Right, they do not code for any amino acids. So these are called as a stop codon. So question says how many codons for amino acids are there? There are around 61 codons are there which is for amino acid out of which the three are unable to do so. So this is the correct answer. Now let us move on to a second part, codons are said to be a degenerate, now degenerate. This is one of the property of a genetic code that is a degeneracy. Now what do you mean by this degeneracy? Degeneracy means whatever codons are there, we have discussed that 61 codons are there. And these 61 codons, they code for 20 different amino acid. They code for only 20 different amino acid. So if I say one amino acid can be coded by more than one, codone. This is we call it as a degeneracy of a genetic code. So one amino acid because we have to code only 20 amino acid and we have a codone which is more than triple, not triple actually which is a three times if I say, right. So, so one amino acid can be coded by a more than one codone this is called as a degeneracy. Now another question says unambiguous.
unambiguous. Now, what do you mean by unambiguous? That means one codon, they always code for one amino acid, one amino acid. One codon, they always code for only one amino acid. That is also called as a codon specificity. Codon specificity, right? So, this is called as a unambiguous or this is called as a degeneracy of the genetic code. Now, come back to the question. This was a three mark question. This is how you have to attempt. Hope whatever the queries which is there in your mind which is related to the genetic code is clear to you. Now, let us move to the next question that is a question number 8. Read this question first. <clears throat> Answer the following questions based upon the Misselson and Stahl experiment. So, hope you remember the session in the starting when I was just discussing about the DNA replication. I have discussed that one experiment was there very, very, very important that is a Misselson and Stahl experiment. Now, question says, Write the name of the chemical substance used as a source of nitrogen in the experiment. So, hope you remember that experiment. Here the DNA was grown on a nitrogen containing medium. And that nitrogen, because when we know, we, hope you remember the sessions when I will discuss about the structure of the purines and the pyrimidines. They are having a nitrogen present, they are having a carbon backbone also present, but they do have a nitrogen present. In this case, when they did this experiment, they took as a nitrogen source that is ammonium chloride. So, answer 1, that is a ammonium chloride, ammonium chloride. Now, this ammonium chloride is NH4Cl, NH4Cl. Now, let us move on to the second part. Why did the scientists synthesize the light and the heavy DNA molecule in the organism used in the experiment? So, second part says we have to explain about a heavy and light fragments. Heavy and the light fragment. First of all, the E. coli was grown in a medium of a normal NH4 Cl, right? Here, the nitrogen which is present in this NH4 Cl, they act as a source of nitrogen. Because they need DNA, because they have to synthesize DNA, replication will definitely happen because cell has to divide. When a cell has to divide, they will use this NH4Cl which is placed in the medium as a source of nitrogen and they will synthesize the purine and the pyrimidines. When the purines and the pyrimidines, they were, how they are synthesized, we will get to know about the replication mechanism. That whether it is a semi-conservative or it is a whole as a not a conservative mechanism or it is a parental type. So, we have to discuss that. So, in the NH4, when they first of all grown that, this was a normal nitrogen, normal nitrogen. Then he saw the two DNA, the two strands of the DNA, they both were normal and we know the molecular weight is N14, N14, they both were N14, N14 only. Now, after that, the second what he did, he took the same E. coli from this and he allowed to grow on a heavy nitrogen. This was on N15. This time the source of nitrogen was NH4Cl only, but nitrogen which he used that was a heavy nitrogen having a N15 isotope. Now, this isotope they incorporated into this and later on he saw that heavy nitrogen or heavy bands they were secreted. And they saw out of these two, 
the n14 was one and the n15 was another right this was the result of the first experiment so n14 was one another was n15 the same the n14 and n15 was there this is of a intermediate density whereas this is of a low density this is of a intermediate density when this was again allowed to grow on the n15 medium all the four fragments they will separate two were n14 just imagine this was n14 this was also n14 again here than n15 because they will separate this will again what he saw the new fragments which is formed in each of these case they were n15 and n15 now they were of intermediate density because one is a n14 n15 another was a n15 n15 so this was of a high density i am not explaining in detail because we have already did the same in the sessions in detail about this n14 and n15 similarly this was also of a heavy density with this experiment it was concluded that out of the two strand of the dna one act as a parental strand and other is a newly synthesized the one which is newly synthesized they take the nitrogen which is present in the medium depending upon the which type of nitrogen do they take whether it is a heavy nitrogen or light nitrogen we get to know whether that this is a semi conservative dna replication now come back to the third one how did the scientists make it possible to distinguish the heavy dna molecule from the light dna molecule that is because of the density gradient centrifugation that is a cesium chloride that is a cesium chloride density gradient centrifugation density gradient centrifugation now this centrifugation density gradient centrifugation in this the different bands they were synthesized different bands they were formed three bands were formed one of a n14 n14 other of a n14 n15 and the third one is of n sorry i have made it opposite this is a heavier so this is n15 n15 whereas this is of a n14 and n14 because they were lighter they were intermediate and they were heavy like this the three different bands they were formed right depending upon the density obviously we have used the heavy nitrogen we have used a isotope of nitrogen that means they will be heavy so that that was present at the bottom now come back to the fourth point which indicate write the conclusion of the scientists arrived right after completing the experiment the conclusion was that dna replication is a semi conservative that half of the dna was from the parents one of the one strand of the dna is from parents the other strand is a newly synthesized so this was an experiment now let's move on to the next question question number 9 so <clears throat> this is a five mark question how are the following formed and involved in the dna packaging in the nucleus of a cell first of all they have written over here the histone octamer is there yes the two molecules of each of the histone you know histone are those which are rich in a positive charge amino acid like lysine is there like arginine is there so histone they are rich source of amino acid or a positively charged amino acid positively charged amino acid which are lysine and arginine which are lysine and arginine these positively charged amino acids which are formed when we talk about the histone histone itself is a protein and it is a positively charged and we know about the dna dna is negative charged why dna is negative charged this is because of the presence of phosphate in them so they help in balancing the positive and negative balance histone octamer is there because in this case when we talk about the histone the h2a h2b 
is there and H3, H4 is there. Each of these, they are present in double amount. This is called as a histone octamer. Total 1, 2, 4, 6 and 8. 8 different such are formed. So, they will combine together and they will form a histone octamer. So, what they do? They help in a wrapping of a DNA. Now, let us look at the nucleosome. When we look at the nucleosome, hope you remember the session when I have discussed about the packaging of DNA. Nucleosome is that which is in which the DNA is wrapped around and around 200 nucleotides of the DNA they are wrapped around on an average the 200 nucleotides are wrapped around the nucleosome. In the nucleosome these are histone octamers are there which are bounded by the nucleotide sequence or the DNA sequence and they will form a nucleosome that is called as a nucleosome. Next we have is a chromatin. When you will see under the microscope, chromatin it seems like a thread model, th like beads on a thread model in which the beads are of that of a nucle nucleosome and the thread which is present, they look like a structure like this. These are the beads present which is called as a nucleosome. In between the linker DNA is present, this we call it as a linker DNA, right? So, next we, talk, we are talking about the chromatin, this is called as the chromatin fibers. These chromatin fiber they further condense into a solenoid and they form a solenoid type structure and when we see at the metaphase they further form a, another structure which is called as a chromosomes, right. Now, let us look at the third second option which is a differentiate between a euchromatin and heterochromatin. These are the two type of chromatin in which the DNA is there. To talk about the DNA in this case or the euchromatin in this, the DNA is loosely packed, loosely packed. In the DNA is very densely packed. They stain dark. Whereas, these are those which stain light. Because they stain light, as we know, because they are loosely packed, so they are transcriptionally active. Whereas, these are transcriptionally inactive. difference between a heterochromatin and euchromatin. This was a question number 9. Hope this is clear to you. Let us move to the next question that is a question number 10. Yes, this is a question from, this question is from gene regulation. Study the schematic representation of a genes involved in the operon given below and answer the following question, right. We know about this, hope you remember those when I was discussing about the lac operon. This is a diagram of a lac operon. Identify the name of the regulatory gene in this operon and explain its role in the switching of a operon. Now, let us draw the same over here. We have, this is a inducer, this is a promoter, this is a operator three structural genes they are present, they are Z and Y and A. The first we have to identify a regulatory gene. In this case, the regulatory gene is this. This is a regulatory gene. I is a regulatory gene. So, answer is I. I is a regulatory gene. First, I you have to explain. How it is a regulatory gene that also you have to explain because the code for mRNA which further code for a protein, actually this is mRNA only, sorry, they code for a protein. When they code for a protein, that act as a regulator. Whenever the lactose is not present in a medium, 
दे विल गो एंड दे विल बाइंड टू ऑपरेटर रीजन वेन दे विल गो वेन आई एम टॉकिंग अबाउट लेक्टोज एबसेंट because they go for a certain proteins which has a tendency to bind to operator region that's why it is called as a regulatory gene so first answer is clear so when lactose is not present they will go and they will bind to the operator region now why is a lack of operon regulation referred to as a negative regulation come to this side when we talk about a lactose is present just suppose a reason that if a lactose is present when lactose is present in a the medium then this repressor protein which is formed they will bind with this this is a protein which is a repressor right so they will bind to this so that there will be no further activation or you can say overall they will be switched off or can i say it is a inactive repressor this is a inactive repressor now this inactive repressor will not be having a capability to bind to a capital z which codes for certain enzyme that we will be discussing so active that is why it is called as a negative regulation because when lactose is present it bind to a repressor and they form a inactive repressor so that the rna polymerase they can further move into this direction when rna polymerase will move into this direction the translation of translation of these particular three genes will happens and they will produce a different enzyme what are those enzyme z always produce beta galactosidase y produce trans acetylase and a produce a permease enzyme now name the sorry y produce permease and a produce a trans acetylase name the inducer molecule and the products of the z y a of a operon in this case the inducer molecules basically when we talk about the inducer in this case the inducers are those whenever the lactose is present when a lactose is present in the medium all of these the structural gene they will be synthesized so they will code for one gene, one enzyme which is called as a beta galactosidase and another which is a y written over here that codes for permease and a codes for trans acetylase beta galactosidase they help in breaking down of this glucose into uh, sorry lactose into glucose and the galactose permease allow the permeability of cell towards a lactose right so that they can utilize the lactose which is present in the medium so students today we have discussed around the 10 questions 10 questions of the molecular basis of inheritance we have discussed some question one marks and like this hope you enjoy the today's session hope the things are clear to you we'll meet in the next session we'll discuss about a new chapter till then take care of yourself thank you so much students for watching this